And I also want to pay homage to the chairperson of the portfolio committee, Honorable Mahamethala, uh, and, uh, and the leadership of this committee, the, um, and the honorable members of this very uh, crucial uh, committee for us uh, uh, in South Africa. Uh, in my other role as a member of the planning commission, I am uh, responsible uh, uh, for international partnerships, uh, understanding how in the, the, the NDP and the implementation of it responds to international dimensions. Uh, uh, understanding how the NDP goals are aligned uh, with the goals of the SADC Regional Indicative Strategic Plan, the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, and the Sustainable Development uh, uh, Goals of the United Nations. Uh, so I know how important uh, this, uh, this committee is uh, in helping us uh, stay the course uh, in advancing the goals of the NDP uh, internationally and ensuring that those meet our national interest and make us a better country in a better Africa uh, for a better world. So I, have, um, I am with, with, the, with the University uh, of uh, Johannesburg currently, and, and, and I'm, I'm also um, the president of the South African Association of Political Sciences. It brings together political sciences in that field. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask to reflect uh, uh, with you honorable members about matter that you probably have very clear views about. Um, so excuse me if I uh, say the obvious and, and do not uh, say anything that is un unusual. Perhaps that is uh, uh, useful for, <coughs> for reminding you about what the, uh, the, the current issues are. I've been asked uh, to talk about the, the relationship between South Africa and, uh, and the US um, uh, since uh, Biden uh, came uh, to, to power. Uh, I guess I've been asked to talk about this because there has been a change in government in the United States and the uh, South Africans and Africans generally have been uh, very interested in how and what is happening in, in, in the United States. And uh, the US election is perhaps one of the most watched programs or, or news item in South Africa in the past three months. So much interest, so much. Uh, a lot of it is, is really about the drama of the elections and, the, and all, the, all the aura around it, all the art around it and the drama around it. But in, in, some, in some quarters, it's also about the meaning of it, the, the agendas, the differences between the two parties and how that might, it might affect us. And I've been asked to reflect on that latter part, which is about how, what has happened in relation to foreign policy and foreign policy towards Africa and towards South Africa, and how does that impact us going forward? So the first thing to point out is that uh, Biden is a moderate center in the Democratic Party and has been with that center for over 40 years. So Biden is pretty much the establishment. It's pretty much 40 years of US foreign policy center as it is, because uh, colleagues would know, uh, uh, honorable members would know that there are various uh, uh, parts of the Democratic Party. So we, we couldn't talk about the political party as if it's just a monolith, one single party. The, 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 the Democratic Party has a center, which is, a very big, which is the biggest part of the Democratic Party. They have centrist views, they generally liberal, they, they generally, uh, pro worker in general terms, uh, they generally uh, pro strong government, uh, they generally pro international cooperation, they generally pro unilateralism and interventionism, they're primarily for democratic peace, doing all manner of things to promote democracy and peace in the world. 
the binary, the generally situated in the U.S. civilizational thinking, the thinking about how the U.S. sees itself as a center of civilization. Uh, on a domestic front, they generally also uh, for inclusion and kind of more broad church, including like all centrist parties are like you know in South Africa, centrist party, all over the world, centrist party tend to have an element to the right and an element to the left all put together. And the centrist in, in the Democratic Party are like that. But they have what they call the progressives or what they call the left within the Democratic Party who are for greater uh, role for the, for the workers, for the poor, they are more, more, more poor, poor, they are more sensitive to the interest of, the, of, the, of those who are uh, excluded, uh, those who are harmed, they want greater attendance to issues of justice, to issues uh, uh, of the ethnic minorities, as they call them there, mentally black people and the indigenous people and immigrants, uh, they are much more sensitive to that. Then, but they're also looking for a greater transformation of the economy to make it less monopolistic uh, and make it more uh, inclusive. Uh, that is not the Democratic Party that is in power right now. The Democratic Party that is in power through Biden is a centrist one. And that is, that is very important. The second point to make is that the general discussion, even in the US and globally throughout the world, is that Biden is a better um, uh, leader to deal with. It's usually, it's usually thought to be better because Trump is thought to be worse. What the implication of it is that then Biden is not a great leader because of what he's been able to do, able to push for, that is able to achieve and, and stuff like that, but it's thought to be better because he's better than uh, Trump. The implication of that again is that he is an establishment rather than a person. He, he doesn't bring anything of his own. He is pretty much unlike, therefore, Obama, who came from outside the establishment, came from the third leg of the, of the Democratic Party, which is the activist, the NGO type, the ones who are concerned with issues, specific issues, not big ideological ideas. So unlike Obama, who came from that, he comes from. Uh, he comes from the establishment. So his real concern is to keep the center holding, is to keep the US, you know, holding, is to keep things into, not transform, not make many good changes, is to keep the center, the establishment, as it's called. So the third point to make is that Biden won. Uh, I, we can confirm that Biden won, the Electoral College confirmed that, Biden won. Um, and he, he won uh, almost by the same electoral votes as Trump did in 2016, which was a significant vote. Trump too, in the Republican party, doesn't come from the center of it. He comes from the anti-establishment part of it, which gave birth to the Tea Party before and gave birth to Mavericks, and they call them, Within the Democratic Party, so they're not very within the Republican Party, so they're not very fully conservative. They are, they are, they, are, they have particular issues. They're flexible on many, on many areas. They're not true conservative uh, party uh, in all that. So Biden won with an establishment. The anti-establishment on the other side, Trump lost, but Trump grew his support by almost ten million. Which means what Trump represents remains a significant part of the body politics of the United States. It cannot be wished away. And that's the, the experience the United States have to live with right now, that you won, but this element, which is anti-established, dissatisfied with the traditional things of Washington, either side, Republican or Democrat, has grown. Those are less ideological, less um, uh, uh, clear about what they do. They just are unhappy with the establishment. But so Trump remains a clear worker. He was he spoke in the GPEC uh, last week, and he he's still the biggest figure the Republican has 
Republican Party has even right now to this day. So he remains a very crucial figure. He remains a big man, nemesis uh, for, for Biden. The difference is Biden, because he works according to establishment, he plays according to the rules and convention, but he's dealing with an opposition in charm who doesn't work according to establishment. He's much more flexible. He's not restricted. He's not, he's not beholden to any particular party structure. It's very difficult for a boxer to fight uh, with a wrestler because the boxer is withheld by the rules of boxing. But the wrestler, especially the street wrestler, might not be withheld by anything except their own interest. So it's very difficult to fight when your hides are tied and the, eye, the hands of the, other, of, the other, of the other party are not tied. That's very important. The fourth point to make is that there is bipartisan harmony in Washington on Africa policy. There's virtually very little difference between the two parties on African policy. Small little uh, elements uh, about, for example, if you look at uh, uh, PEPFAR, for example, which is the president initiative on, 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 on health. Uh, if on, on PEPFAR, the, the, the Democrats would keep it as it is, and it would include financing even countries that um, allow abortion, for example. But the traditional Republicans would not finance that, but the Trump Republican would still finance it, because for them it's pra they're practical about it. They're not too fixated on the principle values of conservatism. They kind of, Though he's seen as an evangelical, which means he's supported by the evangelical Christian belt, the big part of the constituencies of the Republican in the United States, but he doesn't, he's actually not a Christian in the sense of it. He's not a social conservative in that sense of it. He's also not a political conservative in that sense. So in many ways, so the point I'm saying is that there's then harmony between the two. So the Trump's attitude to African pol Africa policy, they all, Trump, Africa policy under Trump should be very similar to Africa policy under Biden, simply because the, there is bipartisan harmony about Africa policy. A key part of that is that Africa is very low in their priority. It's an important part of the world, but it's not anywhere close to their priorities. Their principal, principal priority, their big, 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 big priority is war on terror, as an issue, um, it remains for a long period of time. But in terms of geographies, Europe is key for them, uh, economically and politically. And then the, the key neighbors, uh, Canada to the north and Mexico, then or maybe into the second uh, period. Then it's the G7 countries. Then it's the OECD countries. Then it's Oceania. Then uh, it is perhaps in between those, it's China. It, 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 the US sees China as like top two priority, or three P. And then it is the Southeast Asia, the ASEAN area, very important. Africa then may, or then Latin America, it's very critical for them. And then Africa may keep. If you think about it, I'm naming this, they're like priority number eight. And that is why the policy never changes between parties. It's not an issue they need to work up about themselves about. That is why also the, the nomination of the Under Secretary for African Affairs is, is unproblematic. It's never been problematic. It always goes through the Senate, goes through their parliament very easy. Not a big. The fourth thing, the fifth thing is this, is that uh, this, this Africa policy is about economic diplomacy on one hand. And, and, and in this, I include South Africa. It's about economic diplomacy on one hand. And second is about the U.S.'s uh, security policy, where, where U.S. security policy means includes geopolitical interests. It sees Africa through those two lenses, economic diplomacy and security interests. It's always been like that. It remains like that. It has been like that under Obama. It was not like that under Obama. It has been like that under, 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 under uh, Trump as well. The two critical mechanisms through which this is done is the Africa Growth and Opportunities Act, AGOA, 
and pepper, the, the, the health uh, uh, program. Those are big mechanisms through which it does that. And the key actors are US businesses for Agora, and then US NGOs for PEPFAR. Those are the mechanisms through which the US engages us. And then the third actor then becomes the military uh, for the security interest, the AFRICOM, which remains in place, headquarters in Germany, but it, looking after Africa, it has grown its bases on the African continent, including on that uh, critical island of the Chagos, which the British uh, uh, failed to decolonize, instead headed over to the United States. Uh, and it became the US's big, the, one of the biggest uh, military bases to this time, in which it launches all manner of, 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 of military campaigns into the Middle East and into South Asia and, and so on. So that's very important to tell. The eighth point is this, Biden smiles, Trump grins. That can best describe the difference between the two. The policy is the same, but Biden has a, a better, like all Democrats, a better camaraderie uh, with us, and a co occasional call from one to time, uh, may think lowly of us, but it doesn't insult us uh, directly. Trump uh, uh, told us exactly what he thought. Um, he thought, we, as he put it, uh, excuse my language, as the language he used, shithole countries, called us that. And, um, and, and uh, he called Namibia, Nambia. He didn't even know the country and all that. So the language was different, but the policy was the same. So you can choose to place premium on the difference of the language and ignore the similarity of the policy. In the same way that Clinton smiled and Bush grinned. But from an economic point of view, we made a lot more benefits out of US relations under Bush than we did under Clinton or under Obama. It was still the Republicans that do that, did that because they were focused too more a lot on the economy. They, they push their businesses uh, quite strongly. Um, and it all depended on how we, as, as an African continent and as South Africa, protected our interests while building that relationship. And that's the a key challenge you must think about. I'll come back to that towards the end. They, they were shared elements uh, between us in Africa and uh, the United States broadly. They related to liberal elements in both of our positions. Africa general, South Africa general, and the, and, and the US general can disagree on many things, but they have certain areas that they have shared outlook. And those relate to what we might call liberal elements on both sides. Uh, the commitment to trade, committed to, to open markets, the, the, the commitment to pragmatic cooperation and, 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 and the commitment to uh, interaction and relations, the belief that we can change the world through dialogue, those are called liberal elements of internationalism. And those liberal elements are found on both sides. And they go. So there are areas of convergence that keep them together, and there are areas of divergence that do that. And at different times, the continent and South Africa were able to harness that to their advantage, but at different times, it just did not work. There are also shared elements in relation to, the, to internationalism, broad global internationalism, uh, related to multilateralism, a commitment to multilateralism. Uh, I'm talking about Democrats uh, and, and, and Biden. Multilateralism, global governance, belief in global governance, the importance of global institutions, they are critical and stuff. Of course, the United States want to dominate them. Of course, we want them to be transformed. But whatever the, the, those differences uh, notwithstanding, it simply means both of us are interested in the institution of global government, which is unlike a Trump uh, or the Maverick Republicans uh, generally who don't believe in globalism and they have a problem with globalism and they believe in nationalism. So they have no faith in any of these institutions. They don't even want to dominate them. They don't even want to 
be in them. If they could, they would exit the United States, the United Nations, and so on. They believe in cooperation. We also share certain values, the values of commitment to democracy, to governance, to freedoms, to liberties. And we only uh, share certain principles, values a lot more, but principles, we, we differ on principles. Think about the principle of transforming, whereas they're in the principle of expanding their dominance. So we differ on, on, on principles, even with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the Democrats in power. Other differences relate to geopolitical uh, location. The United States is located in the global north in the geopolitical position. And the global north represents that part of the world that has been dominating the world and whose goal is to continue dominating the world. And it believes that it is doing it for the good of everybody else. And it is seeking to uh, defend the Western civilization and defend the Western idea and keep it going and stuff like that. That's what ge geopolitically, uh, geopolitically not it is. It shares that with countries that are maybe in the geographical south. Because Australia and New Zealand are in the geographical south. Uh, Japan is in the geographical east, but they are all in the geopolitical north. Because the geopolitical north is ideational, geographical north would be geographical. Um, there are also differences on the notion of the interventionism, the belief that uh, some states, uh, the current liberal international order has a right to intervene in order to defend democracy, to defend human rights, in order uh, to defend the Western idea and all of that. So the Biden's Republican, the Democrats believe in interventionism. They also believe in the idea of democratic peace, the idea that you you bring peace in the world by spreading democracy, but not any democracy, not every kind of democracy. There are over 15 kinds of democracies, you know. No, one form of democracy, liberal democracy. So they mean in that. And I also believe in the idea of unilateral, inter unilateral measures, what is often called sanctions, that you can have those unilateral measures to force things to believe in it as an instrument of foreign policy and we diametrically oppose uh, to that general. The Biden's Africa policy is going to hinge on the use of the peace corps established by John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. The Africa Growth uh, Opportunities Act established under Bill Clinton together with PEPFA. Uh, PEPFA um, established under George Bush, by the way. And then the Young African Leadership Initiative. They've already made a I mean about all of this as organizing for, which means it's, some, it's something old. The, the point here is to say the policies has remained the same. Where there are convergence, there are points of convergence that we have seen. Perhaps if we started, if we go get to the Afri Africa, uh, to, to South Africa, the points of convergence that we have seen uh, relate to. Uh, the idea that the US must support African initiative rather than impose its own initiative on Africa. Uh, Africa has pushed this very strongly, especially under Alpha Konare, when she, he was the chairperson of the African Union. And it was again re emphasized uh, uh, under Nkosaz and Zuma. That was a thing that we sought to redefine the relationship between the US. And, and Africa. Um, and then secondly, the principle that uh, therefore the, the relationship must move towards more equitable sharing uh, of responsibility. Uh, it was about uh, 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 greater uh, uh, cooperation uh, on, on, on security uh, rather than the United States moving on its own, going to Somalia, bomb somebody and go out. But no. The AU must be informed and stuff like that. So there's been a bit of camaraderie beginning, but it, it depended on who was in, in Addis at the time. Like I say, when it was Alpha Konare, the former president of Mali, was very particular about African independence, self-reliance, and Africa become, becoming a voice in the world and stuff like that. That was strong. Again, Anna Kosasanatlamin was very clear again about Africa's interest must be 
placed him there, must negotiate, he must take your position. It was quite strong. Uh, in between, uh, it, it somewhat changed. Uh, and, and that has to do with the fact that the African agenda tends to depend a lot on big men on, or big women rather than on institutionalized position. And that's a big, big, big weakness for Africa. What it means even as, as changes happen in the, United, in the United States, we are dependent on who we happen to have at the UN, at the AU. Now we've just had elections in the, in the AU. Uh, Mohamed Fakri has come back as a, as a chairperson. Uh, Rwanda has a, a deputy chairperson, very interesting. Uh, and uh, Rwanda seems to have acquired a lot of influence right now uh, at, the, at the AU, and South Africa has diminished uh, at the AU quite, quite, quite a bit. Uh, the DRC is the chair of the AU right now uh, as a country. Uh, it's going to be tricky because what we need is uh, ability to negotiate Africa's position and defend them in a very strong way. <laughs> And we need strong leadership in others. Um, it, it's not quite uh, promising, uh, I must say. Unfortunately, it's quite promising that we'll be able to strike deals and strike benefits, defend Africa interests, and grow trade and grow value and protect African interests and all that. Now, with regard to South Africa, there have been areas of convergence through various areas. So during the Bush, uh, which became Clinton era, and, and Mandela era, um, the basis was laid and related to economic diplomacy. South Africa also saw the United States as a, an enemy you can relate with on economic time while you disagree on political issues. You just grow economy and kind of pack things up on the political, because there's very little argument on political, big political issues. So, so investment trade and market access grew significantly in, in, that, in that period. And, uh, uh, where there were clashes, it was when South Africa shifted from, when South Africa also considered issues of affairs. You know, in, in foreign policy thinking, we talk about affairs and relations. Uh, relations usually are about unproblematic areas about seeking cooperation, but affairs is about taking positions about issues, which parties must also take positions either in contraposition or in agreement with. On affairs, we disagreed. We disagreed on Qaddafi, we disagreed on Iran, we disagreed uh, even on Zimbabwe, uh, and even under Mandela in 1997, we disagreed on Abacha, we disagreed on a number of things. Because I took a particular political position, the United States did not go on. But the relationship is based to economic diplomacy and also development cooperation. The United States is a big investor in development cooperation in, in, in South Africa and relating to issues of poverty, finding NGOs, finding uh, social relief and all that, huge. And we also had a, an institutional mechanism that was used, which was called the Mbegi Core mechanism, the bilateral commission chaired by Mbegi and Core to manage things where affairs were difficult in order to keep the relations going. So they managed that all the time, very skillfully. And President Begu demonstrated his very huge knack for diplomacy, which is the ability to manage the other party in your interest and do it without breaking the relationship. And that happened very well. Go had left with a, was full of praise for South Africa out of that because Begu was managing. But that mechanism does not continue um, later when Begu becomes president. Uh, they don't have a vice presidential thing. It collapses uh, at, at a time when Bush comes into power because he doesn't want to continue with the, the Clinton idea uh, fully. Uh, what keeps them going is again the same issues, projecting uh, economic diplomacy, uh, US-South uh, uh, US Africa development cooperation, but the affairs, the political questions, continue to test this relationship. But these countries are able to maintain uh, relations while battling and trying to manage the affairs. So always had to manage that, points of convergence and points of conflict and convergence. So it stands politically. In this particular case, President Peggy managed it himself directly with, with Bush, 
but there was never a binational commission established at that level uh, to do it fully. So it decided to manage it on a bilateral bilateral relationship and manage it because of the very difficult time it could uh, honorable members will remember that was the time when we had the uh, September 11 and the United States went on steroids and wanted to militarize the whole world and, 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 and South Africa managed it on the present beginning very skillfully. The deployment of diplomats that were deployed in those areas was very carefully made. The, the people at DERCO who, uh, who, who were responsible for the United States was not just a random selection, it was managed very strategically because we knew this is a relationship we must manage. Because relations and, uh, and affairs are always clashing. And at, at that time, the deputy minister also responsible for that area was really carefully uh, selected, but the relationship remained uh, tense. Um, uh, sorry, um, the, sorry, under uh, Zuma um, and Obama, again, it was the same issues. Uh, those South Africa changed its outlook, or uh, even changed the name of the department from Department of Foreign Affairs, the Department of Relations and Cooperation, but still the affairs resurfaced. You remember that South Africa sought to do relations by striking a deal with the with the with the with the devil with the with the with the with the uh, with the, uh, with, the uh, with the West at, at the United States, United Nations Security Council, whereby they said, "Okay, hold off." Or on your intervention, let us have a dialogue with Gaddafi in Libya. If that fails, then you can consider the intervention. On that basis, we strike a deal, we have a, a resolution. They swindle us. A day later, they just swap the roads. They, in, they intervene even before the dialogue had already continued. So our attempt at relations failed. If we tried it, it, it really did not work. So we find ourselves moving back to the Mandela and Peggy approach, which is harness the relations and make sure they work for women and then manage the affairs uh, because there you disagree. So the relationship remains a bit lukewarm. Of course, Obama's camaraderie was, was very nice and all of that stuff, but the relations remain the same, quite lukewarm. Now, what does that tell us about uh, Biden Ramaphosa? And it seems to me, we were projecting our economic diplomacy, just how it happens, always. Harnessing growth, we have uh, 600 US businesses that are in, are, are, in, are in South Africa. We have over 300 South African businesses in, in, in the US. We have to growing that and trying to grow that, uh, growing investment from the United States and stuff, especially in the automobile industry, the car industry and stuff like that. We were just trying to increase that and move the volume of trade from uh, what we've had now, we've had over 100 billion uh, in, in volume of US trade, trade with the US that we've had. We might be trying to grow it because we know the current administration is a lot about economic diplomacy, growing uh, inward investment and all that. That is going to work well for the two leaders and it will be consistent with how we manage the relationship uh, going uh, back. Similar for the United States, it is also trying to grow economic uh, access in this. But how we negotiate it such that they don't just bulldoze us, it's going to be a critical one. Again, it will not be managed at the presidential level. We know that for a fact. It will be managed at the presidential level. Because in the absence of a deputy presidential binational commission, the fallback position is that the presidents themselves kind of lead to this relationship. It's going to be a huge test on how President Ramaphosa thinks very carefully about how to manage every dynamic with every interaction, make some gains, strike some deals, but that's how we manage it. But if he doesn't do that, Biden will do it and it, 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 it will tilt in the scale. So we'll have to ask, what is, the, what is the South African strategy on the US right now? What is the actual strategy? Is it written somewhere? Who is managing it? Is there a group of people managing it? Because the United States who cannot leave it to chance, it's a big power. It can damage you or it can benefit you. You have to manage it in a very strategic way. It's not some random, just random committee. You must be very careful. You need to ask the DG there, the minister. You need to ask, how are we managing this? Do we have a specific strategy? 
They're part of it. Or it's just going to be without stopping. It's very important. Uh, development cooperation is going to continue. A big part of that is what is called trilateral cooperation, where the United States and South Africa cooperate to assist the third country uh, in, in Africa. I know, for example, the big potato project that South Africa and the United States through USA were doing in uh, Lesotho and in Malawi. I went to see it my, for myself. A, a huge part of the southern part of Lesotho is, is good for agriculture. So they got funding uh, to enable Lesotho to generate its own seeds of potato that comes from the Sutu and to multiply the seeds so that they can be planted in a big area um, and can be, the seeds can be bought easy. And also to make sure that that seed was drought resistant and was pestilent resistant, so resistant to animals and, and insects and stuff like that. So large numbers of ordinary Basutu who are farmers benefited from that project. But what happens is the USA provides the bulk of the funding. South Africa provides the expertise to the South African Agricultural Council and through CSIR and through a, a few South African universities that the government, through the Department of Science and Technology and DECO, they were more with Mopalai. And they provide the expertise, the support in order to create the laboratories and, and all the testing and the training and the support and monitoring. Huge, hugely important project. And that led to a huge rise in the production of uh, of, of, of potato in, in, in the Sutu. The advantage of it was that it cushioned the, the Basutu from a direct impact of a big power called the United States, because the South Africa comes between it to manage what is happening. So the US only provides the money, and South Africa provides the expertise and all that. So the Basutu don't feel this donor recipient relationship. So it became a cushion. It was very good. It helped a lot. It helped Malawi as well. The problem with it is this is that it, 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 it is a five-year project. But Basutu may need more assistance uh, going forward, not of a similar nature, but perhaps more um, cooperation and all that to go forward and stuff. Those kinds of things are likely to grow because the United States sees South Africa in those terms, that it's not fashionable to provide donor funding. You now provide donor funding through a third state that is more acceptable to the indigenous country. And, that, and the two countries work together because we see ourselves as an emerging power, they are a, a global power. So perhaps there are less opportunities for clash, but on questions of war and terror, of interventionism, uh, on the questions of specific issues that the United Nations were likely to disagree. We, we, don't act, we never actually clash, for example, on Israel. Um, the United States tends to vote with Israel Usually a third country joins them, but the rest of our 194 countries tend to vote against, especially on matters of settlements or violence or stuff of that nature. It's just been like that for a long period of time, but it doesn't lead to a clash. It's just simply voting apart. But on issues of interventions in Africa, it can cause real uh, difficulties. The closeness of relationship between South Africa, between US and Morocco, at a time when uh, Morocco is actively pursuing new role in Africa might be potentially a source of a crash. Uh, the US's interest in Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia and its interest in getting directly involved in it, it might cause us uh, to speak against it and uh, distance ourselves from it. So there are those possibilities or more that. There's also a huge opportunity which has been lost since the Mbegi era of harnessing what we call the Congressional Black Caucus in the UN, which tends to be very vociferous about the Africa interest and usually an entry point for us. And Beggy used that uh, with Al Gore under Mandela, and he used that as a president as well. Can I stop using that during the, 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 in, in the past 10 to 11 years? There's an opportunity to resuscitate that and rebuild. I'm sorry I've spoken for long, uh, but I hope I've planted uh, some ideas. I am ready to take questions and, and, and debate. Thank you very much. <clears throat> oh, okay, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Zondi. Forgive me for not now putting the 
uh, the camera, I'm trying to maximize uh, the network connectivity. But uh, thanks very much. That was very much uh, insightful, very informative. And uh, we really appreciate uh, you coming to this uh, portfolio committee and sharing these views uh, uh, with us. And I, we hope that this is not the last time uh, as and when uh, the chair of the committee uh, <clears throat> decides to invite you again, I'm sure you'll always be willing to, to be with us because you have been uh, with this uh, portfolio committee for quite some time and interacting with it. And we still very much appreciate that. Honorable members, the opportunity is for us. Can I see the hands now uh, from honorable members who, has, who want to engage uh, with the presentation of Dr. Zondi? Any takers? Chairperson, Honorable Father, I can't get my finger up somehow on this computer that I'm using today. Okay, let, let me see hands now. Uh, or if you can't, members can't uh, raise hands, can they just shout and then I'll know uh, who is the first. So, Honorable Fiber, you will be the first. Uh, any other members? Okay, I see Reverend uh, Mosheu, uh, Honorable Beckman. Any other hands? Okay, Honorable Swartz, Honorable Nkosi, and then I'm calling it for the last time. Uh, the others will then join maybe when we go for the second bite. Okay, let us start with you, Honorable Fiber. Over to you, then you are going to be followed by Mfundisi, followed by Beckman, followed by Swartz, and then we end up with the Honorable Nkosi in that sequence. Over to you, uh, Honorable Fama. Thank, thank you, Chief. Um, Dr. Zondi, thank you so much for a very informative presentation. Um, I, I, I understand um, where we're going. It seems like we are sitting on this exact same place where we were a few years ago. What is actually worrying to me is the Agoa deal um, that was at the brink of collapse at some stage. And I remember it was because of poultry. We were forced to take X amount of poultry. Otherwise, the US would um, actually take us out as a third world country and we would have lost a lot of revenue um, of export and imports with the taxes, etc. What is your understanding? Do you think that um, our government, you were saying that um, you know, uh, uh, who is now having the strategy with the U.S. on trade um, and what is the strategy? Um, do you think that that we really have people in place um, through um, DTI, et cetera, um, to really pursue the strategy to keep us in the um, Agoa deal um, so that we can actually South Africa benefit from it? Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I also must express my appreciation for the very insightful presentation by Dr. Zondi. Two short questions I have. Um, if I heard Dr. Zondi correctly, he said South Africa did better under Bush and Trump than under Clinton and Obama. Can you elaborate more on that, please? Why and what were the factors that determined whether the South Africa um, did better under some administrations and not under some administrations? Is it because of policy differences or what is the reason? And the second one is the <clears throat> American Black Caucus. Over the years, they have been very loud uh, in speaking in defense of Africa. Now, if we talk about material gain, um, is there anything that we can point to that this Black Caucus 
has done to benefit Africa rather than just speak in defense of Africa. Is there anything we can point to that has resulted from their interventions? And maybe the last one, yeah, maybe let me end with this too and I'll see if others may raise what I've in mind. Thank you, sir. Honorable uh, Beckman, you the next. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much for that presentation. Um, I must say that I think it was a little bit too early for us to make any fair judgment on the US. Um, I think for South Africa anyway, I don't think we've been good partners to the US. You know, I think in SARS, we're not really I don't think we, I think we're more a mosquito, to be honest, to the US. And I think that we need more concessions from the US. And as, is, as the professor says, you know, when it comes to a goer, we should be hoping and praying that we get a goer back um, and that it's not taken off the car, that's not taken off the table. But the truth is, it's not always as good as it seems. You know, what we, what we need to look at is the, is the trade figures and not uh, necessarily the smiling and grinning personalities. For all intent purposes, I think the most interesting place for us is our ambassadors, and yet the ambassador that we had of, of late, having not had an, an, a permanent ambassador appointed from the US in, the, in previously, um, showed us almost that we had not been taken very seriously at all. Um, and I think it's important that our narrative needs to change from our side. And, you know, you're looking at something like BRICS and you're looking at the future of BRICS and BRICS isn't as cohesive and tight as what it was two years ago. And here's something where we almost looked at the East-West dynamics and we have to say to ourselves, well, maybe it's time that we, we, we warm up a lot more to the West and not for anything but the fact that we had a strategy that all people, we, we should ally to anyone and everyone, and that could pay off because we never know where the wind would blow. Um, that we shouldn't really, there's no reason why South Africa should have any enemies. And I think that that narrative should come back at this stage. And especially now that we're talking about Mozambique, I don't think we in South Africa know what it is that we don't know about Mozambique. And why I say that is because, yes, the terrorism might be in the north. And yes, it might just be an inconvenience to us now. But it, what happens when you're too late? You know, what happens if our soldiers are not enough? What happens when we stretched with our resources because of COVID? What happens when our poorest borders are just so porous that, uh, you know, the, the threats are upset with us for interfering in Mozambique and they decide that they activate the cells that I believe are already active in South Africa. Um, I don't believe that we would be able to withstand what takes place in South Africa at this stage. So we would possibly need some allies in the North and the West. And that would be looking to the places such as America, uh, the EU, the UK, Canada, and these are the kind of things that um, you know outside outside people like the like the University of Johannesburg, like uh, the Institute of Security Sciences. So these are the places, studies. These are the people that could probably best advise us because I think in Durko we we almost have a narrow view and maybe even a skewed view of our importance and of our ability, but. Definitely, I think that uh, it's important that we keep an open mind as to the future of our relationship with um, countries like the US and that we keep a very open mind when it comes to trade, because it's definitely going to be important that our trade figures, that the tariffs come down and that we're protected in, in um, agreements such as a goer. So, as I say, thank you very much for the presentation. And I agree with the Reverend, you know, it's always interesting to see, you know, we always think it's the, the, the politicians that are, you know, that look in the media as the bad, bad politicians that are bad to South Africa, but it's actually the figures that don't lie. It's the market 
figures and the market sentiment that one should always look at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Swartz. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And um, a very big thank you to Dr. Zondi for the insightful presentation. My answer is a comment that uh, in South Africa, when we have the Republicans in power, of course, our bilateral mechanisms die off because, um, and then once again, when we have the Democrats, our um, bilaterals will again be awakened, which is an on and off situation for us in South Africa. However, Doctor has mentioned also in his presentation, and I think what is important for us in South Africa is that the strategic dialogue of the Minister of International Relations and Corporations and the US Secretary of State uh, should be always intact because the on and off situation disadvantages us in many ways. Um, for example, for us as the committee that does oversight at DERCO is that they have work related in their APP, which they might not deliver on, which will strongly depend on uh, the strategic dialogue in the bilateral mechanism. If it's not there, there are some things that DERCO cannot uh, uh, deliver on in the APP as a department. So I think uh, the doctor gave us very insightful information and we are very grateful. And we hope it's early days, yes, that um, the bilateral mechanism will be revived in the manner that it should be so that uh, politically, economically, and uh, our relations uh, with the other countries will be very firm, especially in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Swartz. And Kosi? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, and my apologies for uh, joining the meeting late. I had connection problems. I think the professor uh, and his input are very incisive and, and, and relevant and provide the space for guidance. And I echo the sentiments that we must continue inviting uh, similar uh, inputs from various institutes. I'm not going to ask questions, but just to make uh, general comments. Uh, and, and, and first to start, start saying that, um, or by saying that my view is that if we want to characterize Donald Trump properly uh, and his um, attempt at uh, the US presidential uh, elections in the past, it's important that we, for me, it's important that we, we locate it in the, prof, in, in the rising conservative and right-wing politics that began to emerge, uh, in my view, in the late 80s and accelerated uh, up to now. So Donald Trump, for me, comes into play because the world is moving more towards the right, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. And this move to the right, uh, for my, in my view, is it's an attempt to reverse the post-1945 uh, world order uh, that had uh, emerged to balance things such that nobody in the world has got greater influence than the other and a, a, a move to prevent a, a resurgence or a move towards going back to war, uh, the first and the second world war. Uh, whether there's been success of that on that, uh, it, it's something different, but I think Donald Trump for me is should be located in that because if we divorce him or if we divorce his, his approach from that, in my view, rise of in the US, 
in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in, in Europe, it, don't, it won't be possible for us to understand what he does to dismantle uh, international uh, or internationally agreed uh, protocols, standards, relations, and to withdraw the USA, the, the USA from this uh, and, and almost restart again, restart, sorry, not restart again, almost restart uh, international relations on the basis of how influential the USA sh should be. And that's where, for me, the, the, the convergence and divergence between themselves as Democrats and Republicans uh, 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 is expressed. I also want to make the point here that it has come out in the input, but we interact with the USA at various levels. And perhaps our emphasis now is on, at the bilateral level, and we're trying to make sense of what the new administration is doing. And I agree with Bergman, member Bergman, sorry, that um, it may be too early for us to make an assessment of exactly where the, the focus of the Biden administration is going to be. But if you take what the prof is saying, it is almost the same, but with a different emphasis and, and, and with particular nuances. We also interact with them at multilateral and at interest level, inter, on interest basis. So there is going to be, for my, in my view, areas where we converge with them and areas where we diverge. And it, it, it should not be unacceptable. We should not try to converge with the United States at all times, simply because we don't understand their agenda, but we know what the thrust of what they're trying to do at an international level is. So in principle, we agree with them where it matters most. And for us, where it matters most is when the interests of our African continent and particularly SIDEC are catered for in international relations. And that's what should guide us. We will diverge with them where they use military force to impose forms of democracy that are not responsive to uh, ge uh, 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 jurisdictional conditions or where they, they, they attempt to institute regime, regime change. There will be a divergence, particularly on the African continent uh, on those issues. So our relations is based on principle but also on, on fun, what we, re, we should regard as fundamental issues on our side. I just want to say the, the professor has not touched on China. And I think in the list of, of priorities that he has outlined, if I had him properly, China features less in, in the US foreign policy. I think there is no way in which a, any country that conducts international relations could ignore what China is and what China is doing, as we see already in the continent, and as we see with the massive projects, uh, I mean, like this this belt and rail project in 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 southern China, extending to Europe and uh, the what is called the former Eastern Europe. This is a massive infrastructural investment, but underpinning it is an attempt at economic dominance of regions and the world, but also it's an extending military influence uh, in across continents. So this brings to, to, to the fore that the, the, the international balance of forces uh, is changing and ha has changed, has changed completely. And I think we, going forward, we must begin thinking about what the important role of this both emerging uh, international powers, but also of the existent one. And lastly, just to say that for us, the importance of the USA, therefore, on commerce and trade is, is characterized by a, a complexity and competition. We, we shouldn't think that the US is not competing for its products to penetrate all continents, particularly of our continents, its products and services. So it, it, the relationship will always be dynamic. We will, co we, will, we will compete with them, we'll cooperate with them, but our national interests play a very important role uh, in, in, in that regard. And uh, I think 
maybe the prof should comment on whether um, at a strategic level, the mineral energy uh, complex and the military and, and, and containment complexes have disappeared from the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkosi. Uh, the, are there any hands? Uh, Honorable Muela, Zungu, are you fine, covered? Okay, uh, I think uh, silence means uh, that uh, they, they, they are covered. Uh, I'm also covered, uh, I think maybe 95% covered by the input of uh, other honorable members. But I wanted to check two things to go tell Ananda. On the issue of um, the African Free Trade Agreement that has been launched and uh, it looks as if most of the Africans, African countries are signatories to it. So it's promising that <clears throat> it, it, it will work uh, this time. Uh, how can we as Africa and in particular South Africa and the Southern uh, hemisphere side of uh, Africa, SADC, uh, maximize this platform or this uh, structure that we have created uh, to strengthen our particularly economic relations with US? A, uh, which at the end of the day, uh, it's going to ensure that Africa plays a major role as a, as a, as a, as a block this time, and not as different uh, African countries who are striking uh, their own relationships with particular countries. So I, I think if uh, you can just uh, say something on that one and then, the second one is the issue of uh, the theme that we, <clears throat> we, we, we are pushing uh, in Africa. And uh, I think during the chairpersonship of uh, our president, it's one of the agenda that uh, African Union uh, is, 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 is driving, the one of a better Africa and a better world. Uh, <clears throat> because it's important that uh, we start with ourselves. They always say charity begins at home, but uh, at the same time, also reinforcing the relations. And I think Kosi, one of them Kosi spoke uh, <clears throat> very well, uh, because I think maybe in this committee, uh, chairperson, because you, 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 you are part of the meeting, if we can uh, some other time get a presentation where it will be analyzing, you know, the balance of forces uh, internationally, uh, looking at all, you know, the role players, not only talking about a specific country like we're talking about USA, so that you will understand, you know, the game. Because you cannot be part of the game when you don't know what is the game plan and what are the forces that are at play and what, what role are they playing? Who's more strategic, who's less strategic? So I think th th those are the issues uh, that I wanted to raise on my part. Uh, but I think uh, you can now, Dr. Zondi, uh, respond to some of the questions that uh, the members have posed and also comment uh, on the comments that uh, honorable members uh, say. But we understand this is uh, not uh, going to be conclusive. Uh, it's going to be an ongoing engagement uh, with yourself and other institutions that uh, the Office of the Chair might decide from time to time to bring to the committee. And, 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 and we have these kind of discussions with them. So I would like to hand over to you, uh, Dr. Zondi, uh, to have your last um, <clears throat> bite. And then after that, uh, we'll then uh, decide the way forward as a committee. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tabekulu. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of things 
that we need to all think about. Um, generally, um, um, I would classify them into this. Um, uh, Honorable Mershwe, the, the, the point I was trying to suggest there is to say perhaps there's something to learn uh, from administrations that were more successful than others in managing these relations and affairs dynamic in a manner that actually increased value, even in material terms, uh, for South Africa. Very clearly, uh, the personality of a Mandela, who was a big foreign policy president, just as he was a big domestic policy president, was a huge benefit for us. And unfortunately, we don't give back to Mandela's all the time. But he, he, was, he could facilitate, because remember, in our constitution, the, the foreign policy is a presidential mandate in terms of the constitution. And the president is then assisted by a machina. Uh, including DECO, including uh, the cluster, including the, the bureaucracy, including the diplomatic missions all over. We were very fortunate that in 1990, in 1994 to 1999, all of those came together nicely. We had a very big uh, foreign policy president who, who was focused on domestic, but was very attentive to, to, to the foreign policy elements and was able to do that Fortunately, we also had a very big foreign policy deputy president, and the two of them worked together uh, to advance this thing. Secondly, the, the machinery in DFA at the time was going through metamorphosis. It, it still had people from the apartheid department and had new people in there, but, but they had selected the leadership so well that they understood that the politicians would do politics and then the administrative people would have to excel in, in, the, in the administrative side. That thing really came together very nicely. Uh, from Alfred and Zoe uh, to Kosazana Damin and Zuma, there was a, a, a smooth uh, a transition. And in many ways, they understood foreign policy and they demonstrated understanding of it in the manner in which they pursued it, both economic and political at the same time. Of course, you had astute bureaucrats that, that were in there. Uh, that would be led by uh, the late former commissioner of police, uh, who was replaced later by uh, uh, the good doctor. Um, I forget his name now. But all of them are strong leaders. That do that. So when you have a strong president, a strong minister, and a strong DG, when I say strong, it means they're strong foreign policy thinking. They know how to think foreign policy internationally. You are a very lucky country. Not very many countries like that, and remove that. Um, it Beg inherits that, and he works on it because he also was part of the former one. He was very fortunate in that side that there is a smooth inheritance of that and a firming up of that. So the chinery is looking very strong. That is the one criti very critical factor because that machinery is able to get the United States to designate a binational commission through which the two countries are, are managed. And that binational commission was a useful, a very critical in elevating and strengthening the relationship and all of that. Of course, uh, Beggy for us, Mandela is also a presidential uh, uh, foreign policy uh, Foreign policy, if you like, do that and it pushes it and, 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 that, and has the respect of the institution uh, to, to get things done and that help a lot. I must say that President Zuma was not a foreign policy president. Uh, he was not really a foreign policy president. He's familiar with foreign policy president, but was not a family president. He was not a foreign policy president. In the same way that I would venture to say, President Ramaphosa is not yet a foreign policy president or either. But we have known that in our case, you need to make your president a bit more foreign policy president for us to succeed. Because of the same question, not many things are truly fully institutionalized. But making someone a foreign policy president is not by bad, it's something you make deliberate, which takes us back to what Anarit Baba was talking about, about strategy 
which is what also uh, Honorable Nkosi is talking about, which is how to think strategically about foreign policy. It's when you then decide what, which will be the levers you will use in order to advance what you need to get, make sure that the presidency is strong on foreign policy and is well supported by a very strong deco at a leadership level, strategic leadership level to make sure that it is done. It's okay to, to appoint a strong minister, but that minister, one of your first duty will be to strengthen, to make sure that you build a very strong leadership of the bureaucracy, the DG, the DGs and all that. The, other, the DDGs are not simply people who know how to push papers, people who know how to sign where people who know how to get a clean audit, which is important. But at, in foreign affairs, a DDG and a DG level, what they call permanent secretary and other areas, those are leading foreign policy thinkers in government. They provide strategy. So when you meet the DDG for Americas, you should be able to ask them, what are strategic threats that are facing us there and what is our strategy in response to it? And get less, more than just a pedestrian uh, discussion about the facts themselves, but a sense of the understanding dynamics, the power uh, interfaces, the balances that they need to do and the strategy that they do. When you don't have a DG and a DTG who can do that, you must worry. <laughs> Unfortunately, foreign policy is unlike the Department of, um, of Health where you need a DG, a DG who might actually know health issues, but might not be a big thinker on health itself, but must be a big thinker on the governance, how to govern things. But with their call, with foreign affairs everywhere, heads and leaders of foreign affairs are strategic thinkers. They are given time, they are put under pressure by yourselves and others to think strategically. And that is why they should come to this committee and talk about strategy and not just only activities. Because activities never actually advance our agenda. Activities are simply activities. They are chief directors to do activities. But at leadership level, they must be thinking um, at the end of, of Biden, how would we, no, not even think about it, it's the beginning now, but they must be thinking five years time, where will you be? That is how you see when you get leadership in countries, especially in Scandinavia, uh, in Latin America, see that in Asia, especially in Asia, the people in this area, they think strategically. Foreign policy is a lot about beating each other strategically. It's a chess game. It's not just the numbers and, 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 and practicalities game. And that is very important. And part of South Africa's weakness for a bit of the time has been to ride on the advantage South Africa gained in 1994. And, and simply just ride on it. The danger with it is that that thing, which is called prestige, dissipates over a time. It's an account that you draw from and you decline over a period of time. So we have to act strategically to say, how do I keep replenishing, replenishing this account? So that I don't just ride on the miracle of, of transition and ride on how we are known to be, because that diminishes. For example, on the Libya issue, we lost a lot of that capital because there are friends of South Africa who said, South Africa, how did you vote for that intervention thing? Even if you thought the, uh, the Clinton, um, Hillary Clinton was correct to say, we will hold off and we will only apply this stick later. So continue with your carrot. Even if you believe that, but strategically, you should have thought about it, that responding to his own, her own domestic uh, pressures, she would have to employ that tool you've given her now, not later on. So you analyze, you, in foreign policy, you have to analyze, you have to think carefully about all of those things. That capacity to think is what you honorable members are, are charged to make sure we keep at, 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 a, at the highest level, to think strategically about what is our strategy in our relationship with the global north. Exactly exactly what we are looking for, exactly what we, are, we can forego, exactly what the tools we use in order to get to that, exactly how does that advance the NDP? Because the NDP is the basis of our strategy. If we can't explain how we are using it to strategize about the global north or to strategize about the United States or North America generally, in clear. What is the difference in our strategy on the US and our strategy on Canada 
given the fact the two are similar, but very different in many ways. I used to know us having the same strategy for the two countries, but the two countries are very different. Just as we used to have the same strategy on Mexico as on Argentina, they are very different countries. Mexico is a Central African ori in orientation. And Argentina is a Latin American country in orientation. I mean, I'm talking for instance, term. So the strategies must be very different. So we have to think about, which we can help South Africa, is to help South Africa to develop strategies in every area. If we no longer have to have strategies that are in memories of people, strategies must be written, strategies must be thought through, strategies must be refashioned and stuff. The United States itself, it's a big state, it's been all of the state, it still releases what is called the National Security Strategy, which is about security and foreign policy. And we don't release any strategy. We have the white paper, which we had was withdrawn. Yeah, it needed to be discussed, but we need a strategy, uh, uh, honorable members. I can't emphasize that more than any time because the account we are running on is from 1994. We will soon run out of it. We are beginning to run out. The fact that Morocco was able to reestablish itself in the African continent, the fact that smaller countries are displacing big countries, you know, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, even Kenya are being displaced by smaller countries that have better strategies, like Rwanda. Nothing that Rwanda is winning, it's winning simply by chance. It has strategized over a period of time. It's been strategized since 1994, after they had genocide. We diminish while they grow on the basis of who is the strategy. But now if I ask and I put kindly, and I ask my fellow commissioners in the National Planning Commission too, if I ask, you, honorable uh, 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 members of this uh, committee, do we know in this committee what is the overall strategy of South Africa in foreign policy? I know what the foreign policy objectives are, the priorities are, but the strategy. Do we know what is the strategy? Do we know what is our strategy on the UN? Do we know it is, what is our strategy on the AU? How did that strategy help us or not help us that we lost all the elections? in the last AU elections. What does that mean? What does it mean that our friends, even in the region, in Namibia and others, they're starting to pull back from us and the other? What does it mean about our strategy? Should we change it? But is there a strategy? What is the strategy? Because maybe it's confidential, honorable members of this committee have seen it, have read it, and I thought maybe we must change this part of it. Is there a strategy or we operate on an oral tradition where every, we operate on what you know as a DG, and the minister can think of one, but there's no written strategy against which you can hold to. to. Yeah, we develop that. So that's a very important point about it because you will not be able to explain to yourself what happens if, for example, Biden returns a conservative, uh, isn't it a conservative Democrat as an ambassador to South Africa? How would you respond to that? You won't think about it when it happens. You think about it earlier, it's got strategy. What happens if he also delays deploying an ambassador here? What, how would you respond to it? How would you react to it? Uh, we must think about it, Ellen. What happens if the United States push on with a Goa renewal, which is now June, the review one, and reduces the number of products for which South Africa has preferential trade access? Why, how would we respond? Because if we respond when it happens, it's too late. We have to respond. If we learn anything from great countries like Japan or China and others, is that they have a strategy for how they will respond in 2020, written already. Now, do we have a strategy of how, to, how we respond? Should uh, honorable Nkosi, do you have we heard from there for what we how we respond or from the president? How would we respond if there is a even a greater growth of the ultra right wing? Those who, who believe we should not have a world order, we should all receive the two nations, we should break these relations and stuff. We know how we respond. Have we written anything down about it or will we respond when it happens? Did we anticipate Trump? Because we knew Trump was coming or we don't know that it was gonna be Trump itself, but a figure like Trump, we knew it, it was coming already in 2009 when the Tea Party emerged within the Republican Party. 
So we knew Trump, we could tell Trump was coming 10 years before, but did we strategize on it? Even as I sit now, I am seeing things that are going to happen in the next five years. But I keep wondering, are we strategizing about those things? So that when they arrive, we rather say our strategy failed than we say, than say we failed to strategize. But I guess it's our role, we in the, in the National Planning Commission and, 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 and you members in the portfolio committee to force our country to plan long-term and to strategize because that's the only way we will succeed in this very fluid international environment, given the fact that we're a very small country under six, 60 million uh, population means we're ultra small, very small. We are just lucky to be there, but we may be displaced even there. So we must be worried about all of that. So the rise of London, the rise of China, even how we relate to China, is it based on strategy? Is that strategy looking at the pros and cons? Does it look at, it, at the areas of convergence and areas of divergence? There are many areas of convergence with China, but there are also many areas of very deep divergence with China. Are we thinking about those and say, how do we harness the convergence and how do we watch out for the divergence so that we manage it? Are we doing that? All of those things will depend. Even on the AFCFTA, we ask that for Africa and say, Africa, everybody has a, a policy on Africa and a strategy on Africa. Do we have a strategy on others? What is our strategy on Japan? And how does it differ from our strategy on, on, on on China, given the fact we have POCAC and then we have TCAC with the two and the mechanism. But I often find that we are a kind of a nation, a stage, a, a country and a continent that is so committed to the principles. We are committed to reform of this, we're committed to change of this and all that, and we end there. But how we translate these into actual conduct and conduct that favors us and fight the deals and influence and stuff like that. We don't really think about it, but anything we gain in international relations is about how you train and change potential into real influence, which we then use to gain advantage. That is basic strategy 101. Have we worked out all of those dynamics? Are the leaders of their core who meet every two weeks, I think, it's for the DGF, do they spend all their time counting the cents? Or they spend their time counting the cents? Think making sense of what the dynamics were the past two weeks and our dynamics are in this week and how to adjust our game like a good chess player makes. Because the only way if you are small to make an advantage in this world is if your strategy is stronger than your actual power and your size. There's an African saying which says, it is not the work of the big monkey on top that caused the big boobab tree to fall, but it was more work of small little insects gnawing at the root. So the monkey had the power to go up to the tree, but the insect had the wisdom to know exactly where to weaken the tree. Do we have strategy? And for me, that is one of our biggest things because in order to achieve uh, the goals of the NDP on anything, any of the things that we've mentioned here, are goal. Uh, on uh, 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 um, um, on honorable measure, um, on congressional uh, black council, how you harness them and make them use it. It's like the work of an insect, the work of a ant working on the roots of a tree. It is knows where to go, whether I should go to the back or go to the roots. Now, if our roots is the congressional folks, it means we must be going there to gain the advantage and, and harness them to do that. I knew we do that, we did that in, 19, in the 19, late 1990s and the early 2000s. I knew, which led to over 600, over 600 small, big, uh, uh, small businesses exchange from South Africa to that side, and black business from the United States coming to invest here, we did it. But it seemed at the time the presidency had a strategy and it worked it out. We need a strategy again, even now. 
Otherwise, we won't be able to achieve those three critical targets that are given to us by the NDP at that time. Because the only way we're going to achieve that is if you say, this is the strategy we are going to do to achieve the NDP goal, which are also very clear. They, they really give us a sense of how we could do strategy. Even what the NDP talks about, about reviewing our diplomatic uh, missions uh, around the world to see what value we derive from them. We can only answer that question if we say, in relation to this strategy, do these missions in the manner they are, in the areas they are, in the clusters they are, give lead us to this? It means, I don't, I don't discuss the idea of a national interest document, we also be the answer. The national interest document, national interest is not just something in our heads, individuals say, but it's written out somewhere, confidential it should be, of course, but this is what it says, how we should respond to the new approach by the government of Malawi, for example, which is giving us some, some form of opportunity and, and, and things of that nature. So we need a strategy, we need to think about our capacity, and we need to constantly review all of this. And I know that uh, I may not have answered directly all the questions, but Thank you very much for, the, for offering this. Apologies if I have hurt anyone uh, in making this kind of comments, but thank you very much. I, I wish, I hope that South Africa will continue to grow in its foreign policy because it has a huge potential and it has a huge opportunity uh, since it still has that soft power currency gained in 1994. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zondi, that was mouthful. And I think the issue of the strategy, we, could, we, we can't agree more with you. And uh, I think it's, it's something really that we need to look at and, and, and develop it sooner or later. But it must, it's a must. It's, it's not an option. Uh, I will use my privilege as a chairperson just to ask you one, one question or your advice, uh, Prof. or doctor. Maybe it will be a prof, uh, time goes, goes on, maybe I'm professing. Um, the question I want to ask, uh, and just to get your advice on it, um, <clears throat> is in relation to AGOA. AGOA is led by trade and industry. Uh, PEPFA on health issues is led by health. Now, the question is that where is the role of the department in terms of strategic role and leadership in relations with the US? And how can you suggest our oversight approach should be uh, on its role? Because now we, we are involved, but now we've got these uh, departments which becomes the lead departments, uh, which is trade and industry and health on those issues. So, so how do you suggest that as DECO, then we play our oversight role when there is this, uh, what is it, overlap, lapping roles uh, between uh, our department and these two departments on those issues? Thank you. If you can just uh, say something on that one, I think then, will be fine and then uh, we'll then go forward and uh, conclude uh, our meeting. Thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Thank, thank, thank you very much. I um, uh, appreciate that. that. That's one of the very interesting questions. Uh, generally, on, on, on Honorable, um, the, the, <clears throat> the, question, the question of oversight over DECO, even in relation to its implementation of NDP, is a tricky one because many of what things that it is responsible for, it relies on others to work with. For example, on climate change, it has to work with DEA, Environmental Affairs. On implementation or domestication of international agreements, it has to work with the Department of Justice uh, for those long processes of, uh, of reporting and compliance and stuff. Uh, on a number of developmental uh, target like SDG has to depend on a number of other departments that develop. Now, in respect of this, it's a similar case. 
what others do, they create ad hoc opportunities for joint oversight. I don't know whether our system allows that the department, uh, the, the portfolio committee on, on trade and the portfolio committee on health and the portfolio committee on international relations could have an ad hoc joint meeting uh, with the three over a specific issue that all three must report on. Because others do do that, and they call them ad hoc because they're outside the, the normal formalized structure. The second thing others do is exchanging of notes. That um, I remember in Germany, for example, when they're looking at development, they, they do what they call development aid. Development aid could come from health, could come from education and all that. What that happened is the lead department, which is development portfolio committee, uh, on development, then it says, these are the questions you are asking these three departments. What questions you in that portfolio committee would do it? Or can we have one or two people join us in that? I, I was in one uh, portfolio committee we, we, we attended in Germany uh, during the time of um, Fundisi Markenkesi Stoffile was the ambassador at the time. We went to observe there and they had a committee on development, international development. Yeah, that was uh, the, uh, the committee. And in it, it was joined by three members each from other committees because the matter they had to discuss required all of that side. In equally, the Inter Department of International Development from, Ge Department from Germany that was there, it had a permanent secretary, which is what we call a DG, from the other department. So this became a, a kind of a hybrid uh, system. But I don't know if our rules allow something of that nature. The third point uh, um, I, I would if there is always a clear specific role for DECO on each of these areas, and that role doesn't cover everything. So I, I would assume that the portfolio committee exercises oversight, not over the entirety of AGOA, but over how we are approaching AGOA diplomatically and how we are protecting the gains that can be explained by the ICC, but we in DECO protect those gains and over how well DECO and DTIC are interacting on all of these things. Simply because while the DDG or international trade at DTIC is the one negotiating this issue. He, or he, I know is a he, is supported by DECO officials. So we have to look at how well DECO plays its specific role. But we can't do that without clarifying in our mind that these are the four specific roles of DECO in the AGOA issue. For example, it is to set the political environment correctly and make sure that in the world political discussion, AGOA is not lost. Uh, secondly, it is to uh, sensitize the United States about our long-term uh, uh, vision for AGOA and what we hope will happen after 2022, for example. Uh, three, uh, I'm just illustrating, but it's a discussion that we must have because you, you're fortunate that as a portfolio company, we have a mandate, so you don't have it even to think it out. Neither just to call DDG uh, for the Americas. Give us what the specific role and mandate of DECO in relation to this issue. It's four things. That is what we're going to hold you account on. And then, and then we use that. But they also need to tell you what is their strategy on, on our co-op, because the United States has already released twice its strategy on the renewal of Agoa. I don't know whether we've had. Yet from Agoa, we make a lot. And I don't know whether honorable members know that in, in Agoa, we, we trade in over 17 categories where we have preferential access. It's huge. And those, many of them, it, I know that it is primary uh, products for about, I think, uh, for about 20% of those, but the rest it's processed thing. 
if you think about non-metallic mineral products, if you think about agriculture, if you think about machinery and electrical, think about minerals and uh, chemicals, transportation, all of those areas of trade can be used to boost our industrialization because they force us to manufacture in order to take up these opportunities that are there. How are we strategizing on that joint? Those who do trade diplomacy, which is a DTI, and those who do economic diplomacy who are at, uh, at DECO. So we do, it takes me back again to strategy, uh, honorable member, but we can, you can also, uh, you, we serve you, you need to call us, even us in academia, not me, just say, who are the 10 experts in this area? Then expect in this area, put your minds together and suggest to us what are the strategies. Don't make it long, just one page, but process it, cook it, and do this. We don't even need to be paid. We're already subsidized by the state for the work we do. We even train the, we even train the consultants that government actually pays when it already pays us, but it doesn't use us. So even there, can we say that today? We, we haven't had the time to develop a study. Bring ten of people who disagree, who come from very different homes. Cook it out with them. You don't have to take what they say. You take this, you reject this, you, know, you don't have to. But you can't not use the resources of the country to boost the country's standing. And we are at your service, and I know many people are at your service. You call us, we shout, we assist in any way. We can always use our moment to think and think through specific things you want us to. You just put me on the spot now. But if we had said, um, put together a group of 10 people, let them answer this question I've asked, asked you, uh, provide a briefing to me, send a briefing to me. We would have cooked it with other people and bring the best that this committee deserves. But I know many people are willing to do that. Uh, right yourself. Thank you very much. Honorable members, we have had uh, the, the doctor uh, I can say from my where I'm sitting that uh, this discussion is very, very much uh, exciting. It's like we can go on and on and on and on and engage on it. But uh, because there are other responsibilities and other commitments that uh, honorable members have, and I think yourself, doctor, you also have uh, some other things to do after this. So I think we have heard you. Uh, <clears throat> we have also heard our, 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 our views. So, and we have interacted and we have empowered one another. I think at the end of the day, there's no one who's got a monopole of wisdom. Uh, it's the collective wisdom that uh, take the country forward and make us to achieve the objective that you want to achieve. So, but thanks very much, it was stimulating. And as I've said that uh, <clears throat> maybe this is not the first time, uh, you will always come and with other colleagues in different uh, areas of specialization uh, that are relevant uh, to our portfolio committee. Uh, honorable members, uh, is there anything that one wants to say before then we call it a day? Of course, I think your hand is up. I don't know whether you just want to say something or it just remained uh, after you've spoken. Okay, it's, it's removed. So then without uh, Squella, Mr. Squella. Uh, is Mr. Squella not here with us? Yes, sir. I'm present, sir. So the, this was the main item. Eh? There is nothing that uh, you want to say. Yes, Chair Basin. Yeah, this is the only item, Chair. Okay. Now, thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, Doctor Zondi, Sibongega Kulu, Mishonisho, Ungati Noa Nango Musa. Nango Muso, Gomuso Masikela, Yamona like Candalaco, it quillies in this ning, so a Mulazo Onalo, a Liatri, so Yatabanguti, 
lentsele lo sponsela yona yokuthi sikhona sisebenseni eh siyayamkela and eh sizawukhuluma nje we will talk amongst ourselves honorable members uh, led by the chairperson and see how do we accept the challenge that you've put to us and say here we are we are available we are at your disposal and you don't have to pay anything we are already paid by the government and we want to contribute to the betterment of uh, uh, our country and also our continent and the world so use us and i think uh, it's a, it's a very progressive challenge that we are putting for uh, before us and i think we will then engage amongst ourselves and then the office of the chairperson will then communicate with you when the need arises to do so thanks very much honorable members and thanks again uh, doctor and we wish you uh, <clears throat> luck in your uh, further uh, engagements on the day and the honorable members will meet uh, in other meetings uh, that we still have to attend. But that concludes the session of this uh, portfolio committee and uh, honorable members, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, good night. Thank you, Chair. Good. Thanks, that members. can only be more than I was saying good night when the day is yeah, still long. Good night, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, honorable members. Thank, thank you, Chair. Bye.